Hi, this is John Tour of Seago with a presentation, Data Center Fabric for the Cloud. This is a recording of a webcast made on June 13th, 2012, with myself, John Tour, the VP of Marketing here at Seago, and Mike Laverick with RTFM Education. Mike is the author of three VMware books and the owner of two podcasts, Chinwag and Benderwag, and a well-known public speaker at VMware user groups across the U.S., U.K., and Australia. And now, on to the webcast run through what we're going to talk about today. The first thing is what is a fabric? Uh, what What is exactly is a data center fabric consist of? Why do we need fabrics? You know, what is the driver for going ahead and doing these things? And finally, uh, what is specifically is Seago doing along the lines of data center fabric solutions? What makes a Seago solution unique and different? So to begin with, I mean, the, the, what really motivated all of this was the growing interest in fabrics in, in the marketplace. There's a lot of innovation going on out there right now. It's a really a, a gold rush when you look at all the things that have been introduced really since oh, about November, December of last year. The amount of innovation going on from both new and established players has been tremendous. And this has really uh, been happening in four quadrants. You know, traditional players, uh, the Cisco Juniper, Juniper Brocades, uh, new fabric players that are sp uh, specifically looking at fabrics such as Seago, Big Switch, and other players. There's also new technologies coming along, uh, like OpenFlow, that uh, address some of the requirements of fabrics. And then there are players that are new and unknown, such as you know the Cisco Spin-In, which is uh, which is brewing, and others as well. So there's a tremendous amount of interest in this. And I guess the question is, you know, what's motivating all this interest? And the, the bottom line is. There needs to be a better way to connect resources in the data center. Uh, we really know that there's a problem and that the, uh, all of these new players are coming into being specifically to address those challenges. Yeah, and I guess it's also worth saying that uh, the term fabrics, like a lot of terms in IT, has become already abused by, by others. So on the application development side of things, you often hear people talk about fabrics for application development. But I guess the use of the term fabric is, is a search for a, a new word beyond the word convergence, which is one that's been circulating for some time. And for me, the fabric represents a conflation of both the conventional network and the storage network into a single underlying infrastructure. But as a, as a virtualization guy, I'm not just thinking of virtual machine traffic or storage traffic. I'm thinking of all the other traffic demands that virtualization is introduced into the data center and you think about vMotion and VMware FT and HA. And, um, you know, there's been some real challenges around trying to dedicate network pipes for all these different ancillary networks. And I guess the hope is, is that a kind of more fabric approach to the way we deliver networking will make that much easier to deliver than it, than it has been uh, in the last couple of years. Yeah, exactly. And I think the thing that's exciting about the fabric is that the, the definition, as Mike said, is, is somewhat vague right now. Um, it produces a lot of different definitions depending on who you ask. And I think that's the first thing we like to talk about is exactly what this fabric is. And if you can get a little bit of insight just by looking at the definition of the word fabric because it, it does kind of imply some of the values you're trying to achieve here. Uh, the first idea is this concept of weaving together uh, kind of in an XY pattern uh, a crisscrossing interconnect of different things. And I think a weave is apt here because a part of what you're really trying to achieve with the fabric is this concept of any to any connectivity in a way that a, a simple network doesn't achieve. Obviously with a network you can connect from anything to anything but you really sacrifice a lot because everything has to talk on the same protocol using the same um, uh, bandwidth, using the same interconnects uh, it, it, a, a network by itself just has a lot of limitations. When you introduce a fabric, that introduces the concept of any to any, and that can bring in you know multiple different types of interconnects. A second thing is it's a method or style of construction, and that's that, I think that also is apt because what we're trying to achieve here is a uh, architecture. You know, it really goes beyond just connecting. You know, A to B. It, this is not a patch panel. This is a way of building a data center that is fundamentally different than what we've been doing in the past. And I would say I would maintain it's complementary to the whole idea of virtualizing your servers. When you virtualize your servers, you introduce new new flexibility there 
you need a similar level of flexibility in the rest of the data center infrastructure, and for that you need a new architecture. So, you know, we think of a fabric at Seago as really being two things. And I think, you know, you're, again, you're going to get different answers from different people, but we think there are really two primary defining characteristics of a fabric. Uh, first thing is it's a converged infrastructure. And so this concept of any to any is really fundamental to this because when you're bringing together uh, different types of interconnects, you want to be able to combine all, the, all of those things on a single physical infrastructure. And to our mind, if you're not converging the infrastructure, if you're not collapsing everything into a single fabric, into a single physical infrastructure, you really haven't achieved your overall goals. Because the whole idea of virtualizing is to consolidate. And to consolidate, you have to bring things together. So we would maintain the, a, a fabric that carries both fiber channel and Ethernet traffic uh, with a single physical connection is a, is a fundamental starting point. So the second thing is you've got to have virtualized connectivity. You've got to be able to take that single physical connection and make it look like many. Uh, and obviously one reason of this is so you can carry fiber channel and Ethernet. But a simple, a second reason is so you can maintain the isolation of different physically separate networks. So you can have backup network storage networks, DMZ, uh, all the different networks you would find in a data center, have all of those coexist in a single physical fabric and yet maintain the isolation, yet maintain the bandwidth control that you would have with a physically separate network. You don't want to sacrifice anything you've got today in terms of how you manage your networks, how you manage your connectivity. You don't want to sacrifice any of that when you move to a fabric. You want to maintain all of it, yet still consolidate. You think about it, that's really what made the you know, server virtualization so exciting was you could bring together standard operating systems. You could bring together you know, your standard uh, workflows and yet bring multiple applications onto one server. So you didn't sacrifice anything. You just gained flexibility. Well, we would maintain the same thing here as a fabric should give you the ability to bring things together yet maintain uh, your, your existing workflows. And when you do all that, you really achieve you know, a couple of exciting things. One is you get a pool of shared elastic resources. Uh, because you've now got a, all these different elements, servers, networks, and storage combined on this any-to-any -any fabric, you can now flexibly deploy these resources. Uh, what this lets you do is configure and deliver services on demand. Because now you have these resources that can be deployed to different things at different times. So if you've got seasonal workflow changes, if you've got time of day workflow changes, uh, if you've simply got, you know, needs to accommodate perform, uh, maintenance windows, uh, you can do all of that uh, without having to sacrifice service in another area. So because you can redistribute, uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility to you know, maintain a real-time, you know, 24-7 operation. And then the last thing is, you know, we believe another fundamental element of this is multi-vendor flexibility, the ability to come in and choose best-of-breed solutions at, a, at every point in time, because we all know that a, a solution that looks great today uh, is going to evolve. You know, we're at two years from now, four years from now, uh, there's going to be radically different solutions on the marketplace, and you want to have the flexibility to take advantage of those as new as new networking technologies come along, new storage technologies coming along, new server technologies. Uh, you may find other things which are better suited for what you're doing and you want to have the ability to bring those things in and make them part of your pool. And I think it's also worth saying that, I mean, part of this process is part of the process to people wanting to get to a private cloud environment. And um, what I've noticed is amongst the, the various vendors who offer some kind of cloud automation layer, the focus that these guys have had has been mainly on creating soft pools of networks that can be consumed at their layer, but they've largely ignored or pushed off the, the physical hardware requirements to other people. And, and that normally means trying to align what some people might say is quite old-fashioned constructs of the subnet and the VLAN to their existing models. When what really is required for Project Cloud is you know, a new way of provisioning uh, those resources to the, the host itself. 
So there's a kind of pressure there, I think, for a new way of provisioning network resources, which is more aligned to this cloud agenda. And it's not going to be addressed just at software alone. Uh, fundamentally, when you have a virtual machine, it must eventually put its packets onto some sort of physical media. And we need both of those uh, topologies, if you like, aligned to each other, both the soft cloud layer, but the where those packets actually go at the end of the day as well is something that we all have to be concerned with. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole key here is that uh, you gotta, you've got to make this a soft cloud layer where things are flexibly interconnected. And in fact, that's kind of the whole point here is just to kind of sum it up simply. Uh, we see a fabric as something that uh, really define, redefines networking in three Fs. And the three Fs are flat, flexible, and fast. Because if you don't have that softness, the softness to bring together things in a flexible way, if you don't have the ability to flatten the architecture to make things simpler in your interconnect, uh, eliminate the whole north-south uh, traversing problem. And if you haven't built in the speed to accommodate um, you know, the, the, the true capabilities of the servers we have, if you haven't brought those things together, you really haven't fixed the problem. And so that's what we look for in a fabric is something that brings together those three elements of fast, fast, flat, flexible, and fast. The one thing that's clear in all this is that the traditional infrastructure doesn't really fulfill any of those. And that's the whole point here. Why is this revolution happening? Well, the revolution is happening because the things we want to do, none of them is accommodated in the way we do things today. So. Yeah. The, the need for change is 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 crying and, and, and immediate and severe. Uh, traditional infrastructure was not built for the level of of complexity we have in today's data centers. Uh, it was not built for the level of flexibility that we get with virtualization, and and frankly, it wasn't built for the uh, performance uh, capabilities of today's servers, both in terms of their their bandwidth throughput you know, of the server itself and also the need to move traffic between servers in, in today's infrastructure because we've eliminated the traditional three-tier data center where you really only had to go one hop to get from you know, the application tier to the database tier, for example. Uh, in today's infrastructure where the three-tier data center is, is pretty much going away, um, the advent of multiple hops suddenly becomes a crying concern. So both from a complexity, flexibility, and performance standpoint, the traditional infrastructure simply does not work. Sure, and I think there's, there's another thing that we could say here, which is you know, very specific about people's day-to-day -day kind of builds of virtualization hosts. And you know, this applies not just to ESX, but other, other hypervisors as well, is frequently the virtualization vendor's best practices call for a dedicated NIC for each and every type of traffic that you've got. So, I mean, that's not just, uh, you know, the standard IP traffic that comes in and out of a, a virtual machine. That's also the storage traffic as well, and the vMotion traffic, and the FT traffic, and the HA traffic. And I think that leads people to a kind of rock and a hard place. Um, if they've got insufficient NICs or insufficient ports, it means they have to divert from those best practices and start doubling up network traffic, which isn't really recommended by the vendors. For example, I see a lot of customers putting their vMotion traffic on the same network as their management traffic. Um, well, a lot of that vMotion traffic is totally unencrypted and contains the memory contents of the, the virtual machine. Um, so you know, if you've got stringent compliances uh, and auditing trails that require the separation of network traffic, if you find yourself running out of NICs or running out of ports, you end up breaching that. But if, if you have got enough NICs and if you have got enough ports, what you end up is with servers with you know dozens of quad port cards and cabling hell. So whichever way you go with the traditional infrastructure, you either end up deviating from what the virtualization vendor recommends, or you end up with a truckload of complexity because as ever it's very easy to print best practices, but it's quite another to actually have to implement them in a real data center in a real environment. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we've we've seen, you know, yet another example just in the last week with the LinkedIn breach, where even the best of the best, you know, the people that you know really know IT, um, you know, they 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 make they make mistakes and they don't necessarily follow the best practices on every uh, corner of the operation, 
and you know someone ultimately finds a way through. So you know your point bank about the, the V motion traffic is so critical because uh, not only is that data um, unencrypted and, and and essentially carries you know all the crown jewels within it, uh, it's also a, a, a data flow which is very very I/O intensive and and frankly one where we find a lot of network bottlenecks uh, when those when those processes are going on. So. There's opportunities to improve the operation on all fronts by going in and, and re-architecting. And that's exactly what a fabric is supposed to do, is take us from that traditional infrastructure, which is complex and, and has you know, the, the, the exposures that we've identified, to something which is simpler and does not have those exposures. You know, it, it's a kind of a, a funny thing when you think about you can do something that's fundamentally simpler, easier to implement, Less expensive, yet delivers more performance, more security, uh, and uh, you know a more flexible way of doing things. So, it's it's kind of the best of all possible worlds. Again, highlighting why there's so much interest in these things right now. But a fabric infrastructure should be significantly flatter with fewer uh, layers, which is in the Seago case, it's only one layer in between you know the servers and the and the core uh, fiber channel and the core Ethernet. Uh, it is significantly simpler in terms of its east-west traffic, and it is um, a much faster underlying fabric. So we'll get into more detail on that in a bit. But this is the point here is a fabric is a, a, a simple one layer of infrastructure. And in fact, if you look at it viscerally in terms of what it does in your infrastructure, uh, this is kind of a simple before and after scenario. And this is a real life of a very typical data center on the left uh, running you know, a, a couple of NICs and a couple of HBAs. Uh, per server in a in a simple rack of one U servers to the data center on the right, uh, exactly the same connectivity in each server in terms of the number of isolated connections. Actually, more connectivity in terms of bandwidth, but you can see you know a, a vastly simpler um, cabling environment and frankly a vastly more flexible management environment. I mean, I can speak directly to uh, a customer an anecdote that centers around this particular debate. I, I had a customer a couple of years ago who, um, you know, they, they wanted a simplified environment, but they were a bit afraid of using blades and things like it. And the problem that they had is if they wanted convergence and, you know, a fewer number of network interfaces and a, a simple cabling situation, they were almost forced to go down the blade route. Um, but this particular customer who's based in the UK and has a, a strategic position among service providers, I can't name them specifically, they were just nervous of going down the blade road. Um, so we were sort of discussing what their network requirements would be and it, it got to something crazy like they, they thought they would need 12 to 13 NICs per, per server. And uh, I wish at the time I'd had this picture to show them so I could say, yeah, no, you can go down this route of, you know, a nick for every single bit of traffic you've got. Um, and with the best will in the world, even if you have the, the greatest cabling guy in the world and the greatest laborer, uh, labeler in, in the world, the last thing you want to be is at the back of a rack with, with you know, a truckload of cabling trying to find the faulty cable. Um, you know, you can end, I mean, the actual pictures that we've got here is, you know, the, the, the one on the left is actually quite a well cabled system, but you know, I've seen, you know, less tidy racks where it, it can look like something from the, the back of the 1940s computer at Bletchley Park. So, you know, try being the guy who does the troubleshooting on the infrastructure where, you know, every cable is, is armatured away and if you've got a buggy cable or a bad cable that needs to replace or even a, a change at the switch layer to be done, where do you begin? It, it's overwhelming that like, level of complexity. Right, which is where you hear the stories about, well, when we need to swap out a cable, we just cut the two ends off and, and the cable stays there forever. Um, and we just uh, overlay the new one on top of it because, frankly, di diving into the bundle and, and replacing it is just, um, as you said, Mike, it's, it, where do you begin? The way a fabric fixes that problem, I'm mean, getting into the nuts and bolts here for a second, but the way a fabric fixes this is, is a, a, to converge and virtualize. And if you, this is the before scenario here, so this is kind of your rack on the left is the, is the before picture here. Uh, what a fabric does is it comes in and, and fundamentally changes the way you're hooking those things up. So you've got your fabric in the center, uh, and this is a scalable thing where right, I've shown two boxes here uh, constituting the fabric, but of course you can scale that out to many more uh, depending on how many servers you want to hook up. But uh, each 
server is connected into that fabric by two connections for redundancy, uh, a single card inside the server or two cards if you prefer. And then that fabric device is connected into all the different networks and storage down below there. And all your standard networks, DMZ, production, you know, different types of storage devices, uh, those can all be individually connected into separate network connections on that fabric. Uh, within each server, you're presenting standard looking resources. So that's the whole beauty of this is that within each server, you're presenting NICs and HBAs just like you were before. So you talk about, you know, Mike mentioned his customer with the uh, wanna, 16 NICs. Uh, you can still do that if you're if you want to have 16 se physically separate networks to keep all that data all that traffic isolated you can still do that but now you can do them virtually so you have virtual NICs which are software resources you can have as many of them as you like uh, all operating on separate networks so you when you create a NIC it's it can be connected to a isolated network within that fabric and the same thing with an HPA you create a, a separate fiber channel connection it's all going out to different things in the outside world. You know, once you get to that bottom layer of the networks and storage, each of those things is connected into different networks, different storage, or you can create networks on the fabric itself, but they all share a phys single physical construct, you know, single physical interconnect, which is that data center fabric layer. So that you're saying, well, what about you know bandwidth? Is this thing going to you know, slow me down? The answer is no. You, the idea is you create enough bandwidth from the server to the fabric such that that connection never becomes a, a bottleneck, and you create enough bandwidth across the fabric itself such that that never becomes a bottleneck. And in fact, what you end up with is a, is a fundamentally faster infrastructure because it's like building a freeway. You know, you've got a, you're building a big fat pipe, which you can then share dynamically as opposed to building you know, a bunch of city streets, which uh, you know, eight lanes of city streets don't carry nearly as much traffic of eight, as eight lanes of freeway because they can't be dynamically allocated. You know, you, city streets are just fixed. They go from one block to another, whereas freeways, you know, people can share the lanes uh, as they need for traffic. So you get a lot more bandwidth capability out of a big fat pipe than you do out of a bunch of uh, little skinny ones. And within each of those connections, with each of those virtual connections, you can create quality of service controls. So even though you're sharing a resource in that fabric, you can still guarantee quality of service on a specific connection just like you can with a, uh, a physically separate infrastructure. So you, you haven't sacrificed anything. You've still got isolation. You've still got quality of service controls. Uh, you still got the ability to deploy as many NICs and HPAs as you want, but what you've uh, gained here is a much, much simpler physical infrastructure. Uh, you, have, you also haven't lost anything in terms of your interoperability. You know, you can run any OS or hypervisor, but be it you know VMware, Windows, Hyper-V, uh, Oracle, v, Oracle Virtual Machine, you know, whatever you prefer, it all can be done in this environment. But it's fundamentally easier to manage because these resources are in software, so they can be migrated just like you can migrate virtual machines. You can migrate this, these I.O. resources from one device to another. And a key part of this is that when you do that, you're migrating the entire resource, including the MAC address and the worldwide name, such that you know, the, an entire identity from a server can be moved to another server you know, for failover, for, for maintenance, uh, for you know, system upgrades, whatever you're doing. Without any remapping, you can take the entire I.O. identity and move it to another device. And when you want to add new networks, uh, you know, a big part of this is flexibility. When you want to add new things for new requirements, such as, you know, say, say payment card in information, um, you can create isolated networks simply by plugging them into the fabric at the physical layer. And then at the virtual layer, you can add resources to, uh, to live servers. So you gain so much flexibility to do things that you didn't have before, but you haven't sacrificed anything in terms of your ability to isolate traffic, to control performance of traffic, and to deliver um, uh, bandwidth to servers. You know, it's all, all the capabilities are still there. You just gained a whole lot of management flexibility along the way. So with that, um, we kind of went through some of the, a little bit of the high level on fabrics, a little bit of the nuts and bolts. 
let me just say a little bit about why we need fabrics. You know, what's kind of what are the drivers that are that are you know coming along to make this a requirement right now? Really, it's four things. You know, it's convergence, bringing together things that are you know we're, haven't been together before because we're consolidating data centers or we're consolidating resources within a data center. Uh, the growth of virtualization, which is you know, now uh, you know, past the 50 percent point, the need for you know, devices, expanded services associated with bring your own device, uh, more things are being moved from the, the remote locations or, or uh, uh, desktops, more of those things are being moving into the data center and they have to be supported in the data center environment. And then finally security, you know, the need to accommodate new uh, types of information in the data center and do it in a fundamentally more secure way, either because of uh, regulation or because uh, you know there's just a lot more data that you're having to control that uh, has to be secured in ways that we haven't done previously. And I think I could add, you know, that 50%, a, a bigger portion of it was probably the low hanging fruit that a lot of people found relatively easy to virtualize in the first place. And I think virtualization has proved itself, but the kind of people who are hostile, for want of a better word, to virtualization now no longer point to the virtualization layer. They point to other layers as potential reasons why their particular workload shouldn't be virtualized. So, I mean, virtualization has always had an element of politics with application owners who might have been a bit suspect about it. But now they point to, well, you know, are, are there IOPS concerns or IOPS limitations, especially around the world of virtual desktops? And then when it comes to server-based applications, tier one applications, there's that politics of, well, can you guarantee the same quality of service to the network or storage as I used to have when I was on a, on a physical box? So, I mean, I think so far the emphasis has been on software virtualization from the likes of VMware because it's been relatively easy to introduce and we could focus on the lower hanging fruit. But as we try and drive more value out of virtualization, that necessitates more uh, contentious, more uh, politically sensitive workloads being moved into that layer. And I think the focus is going to change to looking at you know, IO virtualization, looking at storage virt virtualization, in an effort to demonstrate to those you know, key business owners that you know, this particular application, we can make this not as good as a physical machine, but better than a physical machine um, in terms of its portability without any fear or any doubts about will it perform as well. Yeah, exactly. And with, and the fabric really does all these things. I mean, it really addresses all these challenges because with convergence, we, we can bring things together in this manner of any-to-any -any connectivity that uh, Mike and I have talked about. The virtualization growth is addressed with a fully virtualized infrastructure that comes with the fabric. The expanded services become simpler to accommodate because of the simplicity of the fabric. And the fact that it's converged and virtualized also means that it's you know, simpler and more scalable. It just becomes easier to add resources and re deploy resources over time. And then finally, you know, the, the concept of, of network isolation within the fabric really helps to address the security concern because if, if you only have you know, two NICs and two HBAs in the server, uh, you're going to be limited as to what you can do to isolate traffic. You're going to be reliant on, on constructs like virtual LANs in order to do that. Uh, and um, you know, frankly, it, it may give you a lot more peace of mind if you can actually isolate traffic uh, as, you, as you need to over time as opposed to just having to rely on uh, software tools. So, you know, what, the, what are the things that are happening now? Well, we, we mentioned already that a virtualization is passing the tipping point, and it's worth noting, you know, part of the reason for this whole uh, urgency of this is this is a very fast-moving trend. Uh, we, we, we know that you know, we're about 50% virtualized now. What people often forget is that, you know, just three years ago, that was only 18% virtualized. So this is a very, very fast-moving trend, and it really puts a lot of urgency on looking at how we can use fabrics to address the challenges of virtualization. You know, and when we get to the fully virtualized data center, that's when we start talking about becoming a private cloud. And this is something that's been talked about for years, and frankly, it's got another one of those terms that got kind of beaten to death and perhaps uh, overused. But uh, you know, if you consider a private cloud to be a fully virtualized data center, 
uh, this is something that's real now. And that's one, you know, one thing that Gartner pointed out just last December is that we're going to see a 10x increase in private cloud deployments in 12 just because of this you know, rapid increase of virtualization. The third point is servers have gotten so much more capable in the last three years that uh, if we're not building in an infrastructure that better utilizes our capabilities, we're, we're just leaving that capability behind. We're, we're, we're throwing it away. And you know, that was something the infrastructure a few years ago just wasn't really set up to accommodate. And frankly, the servers didn't really need that much. But uh, with uh, Nehalem and now Romley, the I.O. capability of servers is tremendous. We, we see 40 gig throughput on servers, legitimate traffic, you know, I.O. traffic um, today using you know, the next generation servers from uh, you know, HP, IBM, Dell, et cetera. So this is another thing you need to be thinking about is how am I going to utilize all the bandwidth these servers are delivering? And then finally, you know, the other you know motivation I think why probably a lot of you are listening today is just that the fabrics are appearing everywhere. You know, we're we're seeing this trend occurring uh, with the vendors on a number of different fronts. I think the other thing that could be said here is is that it's a, a kind of fundamental law that you know when you consolidate servers and for that matter consolidate desktops, what you're also doing is consolidating the I/O at the same time. Now, back in the kind of early days of virtualization where we were going after the low-hanging fruit, it was very easy for me to say back in 2003, yes, you can use a, a one gig link for this particular uh, piece of network or for this particular um, application, because a lot of the times those particular links weren't especially saturated. But that was 2003, you know, that's almost 10 years ago. And what we're doing is demanding even more out of these servers. And yes, they may be going up in terms of their compute power uh, and so on, but we can't carry on doing that on the same network infrastructure and storage infrastructure that we had 10 years ago. Um, and for me, in a way, the, the way consolidation is, is happening is it's kind of come out of a growth in things like NFS and iSCSI where Vendors like VMware now have very good, rich support for different storage protocols. And so for, for some of my customers, uh, consolidation is a kind of matter of fact. Their storage network and their Ethernet network is the same network. Um, but what they haven't really addressed is the management aspect of that and the I.O. challenges that they're going to address. So, I mean, it's just the fundamental laws of physics. We can't keep on adding more and more virtual machines and bigger and beefier yeah, monster VMs and assume that we're going to get the same level of I.O. out of them if we don't address the actual physical layer of that, where that network traffic actually winds up at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole point here is that, um, you know, where is that traffic ending up and how, how is you know, the network uh, infrastructure going to accommodate that? So the whole point of a fabric is to create that infrastructure we talked about in the previous section. You know, this this la single layer, uh, which uh, provides that that interconnect in a way which is simple and by converging all the things, uh, is agile. I mean, it's introducing the concepts of software-defined networking because w within this physical environment that's you know essentially just a w single layer of switches. Uh, we're defining a software-defined network, which can give you a very rich tapestry of interconnects, uh, you know, with different virtual machines interconnected, um, uh, virtual machines connected to different networks, virtual machines connected to different storage. Uh, we can do all of that in a software-defined way using that single physical infrastructure. And then finally, giving you a high-speed infrastructure that is, you know, highly utilized because uh, that single fat pipe, when you create that tapestry of networks that overlays that physical infrastructure, um, you really can make much better utilization of it. As a matter of fact, that's one thing that I think people often overlook is that you know, we, we, it's been well known that servers have been underutilized. We all talk about you know, it's 5% utilization of servers that was so common you know, five years ago. Um, reality is networks and storage, and both, both fiber channel and ethernet networks, they're in exactly the same boat. That five percent utilization of networks that we had, you know, that five percent utilization we had on servers a few years ago, we have exactly that same problem on networks today. 
Uh, and then the last issue is this whole concept of the east-west traffic and the north-south traffic. Uh, the, today's network infrastructure with its different you know, layers simply creates a whole new set of bottlenecks as we're trying to move traffic from east to west because the traffic has to traverse up and down. So you know, the, we can address all of that with that single flat layer of infrastructure that really allows that traffic to flow east-west uh, much more fluidly. And I think there's another aspect here as well, which is as as this becomes the way, the de facto way that people do things, I think we'll begin to think less about the nuts and bolts of the hardware and start to think more about resources. You know, I've got I've got virtual machines, they need storage, they need networking, they need a certain amount of security. And what we should be focusing on is less about the nuts and bolts of how everything is sort of linked together but trying to align those resources of compute, storage, I.O. to the application or demands of the application in the business. Now that, that could be an internal private cloud or it could be a public cloud and I'm a service provider offering up resources. But what I have to have is a much more seamless way of matching the, the resource demands of the application or the, the project I've got to the resources it needs. And it's very hard to do that right now with the kind of infrastructures that we have because you have to be too closely down in the weeds uh, trying to handle all these different kind of relationships between the various parts that make up the infrastructure that allows that application to work. And if, if we're going to get to the cloud, it's got to get faster and it's got to get much simpler to manage these resources to the point that it becomes almost a trivial act to say, I want this VM to reside here, there, with that particular level of quality of service for both storage and networking. Next one, please. Yeah, and exactly. That's and that's the point here is in the in the environment where you're creating this fabric, what you don't want to do is create complexity which makes management impossible. And in fact that's what we're delivering here is by giving providing a, a very familiar looking environment where you've got virtual NICs and virtual HPAs inside the servers that look like standard resources. Uh, you can converge the infrastructure yet maintain a very uh, familiar looking interface both on both inside the server where you've got the you know, virtual resources and outside the server where you're connecting into these different uh, networks that exist in the data center. So the whole point here is to maintain as much as what we've got right now yet make things better. So converge it, you know, make it flatter, and then provide the software to find connectivity so that you're, um, you're able to manage this thing dynamically over time. Uh, another key part of this is agility. You know, you want to be able to manage things without having to reboot servers, and that's uh, you know you want to be able to change virtual NICs, uh, add connectivity. Um, you know, many of our customers right now are running over 100 virtual machines per server. Having to you know, migrate all those virtual machines onto another device, then perform maintenance and migrate them all back, it's not a trivial task. So if they can avoid uh, reboots in the process, um, you know, all to the good. Uh, everyone's inv everyone's involved in a 24/7 operating environment, so the ability to provide new services quickly, you know, is a key is a key part of this. And then finally, you know, the ability to connect from anything to anything, uh, as we especially as we consolidate data centers, uh, the need to connect every server to every resource becomes really critical because that's where you get the flexibility to deploy applications dynamically and put them wherever they wherever it makes sense and, and reallocate them over time the last part of this is you know the speed um, one thing people often overlook is that you know the, the bandwidth constraints of the network do present operational issues in things like vmotion you know Mike you talked about that a little bit earlier uh, in terms of security concern, it's also a huge concern in terms of time because when you're running 100 virtual machines per server, the time to vMotion becomes an operational constraint. And that's, we actually see customers that were limiting the number of VMs per server just because of the vMotion times. Well, if your objective is to get you know, the optimum utilization, you don't want that kind of constraint. And same with backup. You know, you, you've got to be able to back up your data within the window. Uh, how are you going to make sure that happens? So bandwidth, quality of service to give you the you know connection speed that you need, and then uh, finally you've got to eliminate latencies because latency is the killer uh, as you as you as your operating environment becomes more and more uh, complex, latencies add up, 
and that becomes a, a performance you know, death. So how do you eliminate latency? Well, you, by reducing the number of hops and by giving yourself a faster network. Yeah, I mean, just to expand on, on the vMotion side of things, I mean, I think vMotion is often seen in a, in a very small context, but people who know their, their VMware or even Hyper-V well know that vMotion is intimately tied into a whole series of other functions. Um, but just speaking about it generally, I mean, it's not just, you know, environments where there may be a high density of VMs, you know, where people are trying to pack as many desktops on, on one physical server. Um, what I'm also seeing is uh, very large ESX hosts running quite a small number of VMs, but those VMs are tier one based applications with very large memory requirements. So although the, maybe the ratios aren't as high, the memory consumption is still the same because it's just a bigger app. But if you think about it, you know, getting into maintenance mode, that's required for things like patch management. Uh, the longer that takes, the longer that host isn't part of the cluster. Therefore, you know, do you have to factor in that into your calculations for high availability? You know, I need uh, M plus one plus one for maintenance mode. Um, and then there are other functions like uh, DRS, piggybacks off vMotion, storage vMotion itself when you want to move VMs away from one uh, unit of storage to another. And for those who are doing it, it's not a massively popular function, but the distributed power management features in VMware where a host can be brought into standby mode if it's not required, that requires an evacuation of all the VMs of it. So I think, you know, when we look at the, the fastness the way I'm looking at this personally is, is that the way the network is kind of transforming itself is as big or as big a game, change, game changer as, say, SSD is in the world of storage. You know, you take the spindle out of the equation when, when you introduce SSD into your storage environment. Take latency or take time out of the equation when you start moving up to these faster networks. Um, so, I mean, I think the other thing that you could think about is if you're worried about latency, maybe one reason to worry about it is not because you've got a legacy system, but you have got the latest and greatest array which can deal with you know, a terrifying amount of IOPS. The last thing you want is your network to then be the source of the battle bottleneck between the server and where it's trying to write to. Um, so you know, it's hard. I think you know, when people look at the next generation of data center, they should be looking across the whole of the architecture from the server to the network to the storage and trying to get all their ducks in a row, if you like, to maximize the investment. There's, there's very little point in having the latest and greatest solid state storage if the network architecture to it just can't uh, drive the IOPS to make that purchase even worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. And, and all of these points really apply across a variety of areas. I mean, whether it's where we're talking about virtualization, which is kind of what we've been talking around here, or it's or it's you know close cousin VDI. Uh, whether you're talking about virtualization or VDI, or even around uh, database or just you know cloud environments, which could be a whole variety of things uh, thrown into one environment. Fabric-based solution applies equally to all of them for all the you know reasons we've been talking about here. You know, increasing the performance, increasing availability, and reducing costs. So with that, let me just uh, dive into just few minutes about the Seago solution. We'll close with a few, uh, just a few quick case studies and uh, some com summary comments here. So the Seago data center fabric solution uh, provides the, all the attributes we've been talking about, obviously, you know, in terms of converging Ethernet and fiber channel. Uh, it does provide an open architecture, so it's standard touch points at both ends of the wire, meaning you know, you're providing the virtual NICs on the inside HPAs, all of which look standard and then standard touch points outside, you know, standard Ethernet and fiber channel connections. So it's all vendor neutral because it all looks like regular old garden variety Ethernet and fiber channel stuff. Uh, it's also, you know, exceptionally fast because the transport itself is up to 56 gig per connection. So per server connection, 56 gig. So two into a server means you've got 112 gig of bandwidth and active active. Uh, and it provides isolation without reliance on VLANs and scales to a thousand servers. So you really have eliminated all the limits in terms of performance and scalability, uh, all the things that which are you know, tear, uh, tie down the traditional networking environment. 
and then finally it's always on because you know you, you're doing this kind of configuration on on live servers there really is no downtime required to maintain the environment uh, when I say you know leveraging your you know existing investment with an open environment this is really a key point because when you're implementing a fabric a question is always what is it going to do to the equipment I already have? I mean, how is it going to impact my current environment? And the answer is it shouldn't impact it at all. You know, you should be able to come in with your existing servers, your existing networks, existing storage, uh, use what you want, you know, reuse what you want, uh, and maintain the flexibility to buy whatever you want down the road. So this is a key part of the fabric is it should be easy to implement because it should just be a, a, a simple layer that gets inserted in, in the middle in between your servers, networks, and storage. And you shouldn't have to sacrifice anything in terms of security or isolation. Uh, Seago lets you deliver an isolated connection from different virtual machines to virtual NICs to different networks and maintain the isolation of physically separate networks uh, within that converged environment. So when you talk about, you know, how do I handle payment card information, SOX information, you know, HIPAA information, how do I maintain uh, simply, you know, keeping all my passwords for my users separate from my network uh, that is exposed to the outside world, this is a simple way to do that within a converged environment because they are set, they, they behave exactly as if they were physically separate connections. And this has been audited by security people and, and they've confirmed that yes, um, this is isolation without reliance on VLANs. So it's a very secure operating environment as well. And then finally, you know, it's converged. You know, we're bringing together fiber channel and Ethernet um, on a single lossless, highly reliable fabric. So it was a fabric that was designed from the start to handle, you know, the lossless requirements of fiber channel. So you don't you don't have any concern with uh, with any packets being reordered because uh, the, the fabric was designed to not do that from the beginning. Uh, it operates at full line rate on Ethernet and fiber channel. So we want to move 10 gig Ethernet plus fiber channel at 8 gig over a single connection with multiple connections, multiple virtual connections. They can all run at full line rate. And you know this is all enterprise accepted and proven because again what we're presenting to the outside world is very standard looking silicon. It's not uh, it's not doing anything you know, um, uh, not introducing any new protocols, it's not introducing any new standards, you know, simply presenting standard silicon to the outside world. This is all accomplished with really four separate products uh, that come together to make this happen, one of which is a hardware product, and it's the only Seago unique hardware in this environment. The Fabric Director is the only thing we sell that is uh, specifically Seago. So the, the cards that go in the servers are off-the-shelf cards, you know, the interconnects and the fabric itself is off-the-shelf components. Um, the fabric director is the glue that ties it all together. That's managed with the fabric manager. Um, and then uh, the fabric accelerator is a way of running data from server to server entirely over the fabric itself without going through the fabric director. And then the fabric performance monitor is a way of looking at data um, traffic in a very granular way. The fabric director is very straightforward. You simply connect in the servers at that top layer, uh, connect in the uplinks in the bottom layer. So those I.O. modules on the bottom provide your uplinks to uh, Ethernet networks, fiber channel networks, you know, be they 10 gig, 4 gig, 8 gig, whatever. And then the top layer provides the server connections into all the different servers uh, that you've got in your fabric environment. The fabric director comes in two sizes, small and large. The only difference between them is the number of I.O. modules you plug in. Other than that, the functionality of the two is, is exactly the same. It's all managed with the Fabric Manager, which is a highly intuitive uh, interface for looking at uh, connections in the virtual way. So part of the appeal here is you want to be able to see connections that exist uh, in your environment as physical connections, just as if they were wires, but you want to be able to manage them virtually. And that's exactly what we show. So we show individual connections um, that are completely software defined, but they look as if they were, you know, Visio diagrams. And what you notice if you look at that diagram on the right, 
you don't see the CGO box in there anywhere. If you see a servers, you see virtual switches, you see virtual machines, you don't see the CGO box. And that's because the CGO environment, the CGO fabric, is in fact transparent. Um, it's a very different operating environment than when you're dealing with, uh, you know, a Cisco or more of a command line interface, uh, purely um, uh, switch port and uh, um, cable-driven environment. The Fabric Accelerator performs that server-to-server -server connectivity, which gives you that private virtual interconnect. So this is creating, you know, a network within your Fabric. So you can create a network of completely software-defined connections from server to server uh, that travels entirely within that fabric and doesn't go doesn't ever you know, go to the outside world and these are isolated networks within that single physical infrastructure the advantage here is that you know they're going entirely over that Seago fabric so they're extremely fast uh, you're taking full advantage of that fa that fabric you can actually get you know 40 gig Ethernet connections today um, from server to server that um, you know, accelerate vMotion, accelerate backups, um, and have no constraints um, from the outside network. So you're not, you're never, you're never putting any load on your the Ethernet network in your data center. And it's also, so, you know, fully software defined. So the, the, it's very quick and easy to, you know, configure connections from one thing to another. Uh, and you have no reliance on VLANs here, so you're not having to configure VLANs, and you have no risk of VLAN exhaustion. The implementation of a fabric is, is really straightforward because it is an incremental approach. You know, the fabric director sits at the top of rack along with your, you know, be they blade servers or rack mount servers. Uh, in fact, you can start with a single rack of servers uh, with a pair of fabric directors at the top. And that can be the, the beginnings of your data center fabric. And it can coexist with everything else that exists in your data center because that Seago fabric is going to plug into your existing Ethernet core and your existing fiber channel core. So you really got minimal disruption to bring this into your data center you know, as it stands today. And as you grow, uh, it's simply a matter of adding you know, more racks, more, more fabric directors, uh, and tying those fabric directors together to create you know, this larger data center fabric. And you can, that scales up to 1,000 servers. Uh, so you can interconnect you know, a very large number of racks, and you can interconnect between any of those racks using these private virtual interconnects that we talked about before, using the Fabric Accelerator. Everything can be interconnected within that fabric. You only go out to the, the core Ethernet and the core um, fiber channel when you need to connect to those resources. So it scales easily. It's non-disruptive to implement, very low cost. Uh, well, frankly, a lot less expensive than doing it the traditional way. Let me just give you a few quick uh, case studies. I'll just do two here. One is Accenture, a, a customer of Seagos for about three years now. And they started out with a very traditional environment, the one on the left, uh, running uh, Ethernet and fiber channel, two, uh, eight Ethernet connections per server, two fiber channel connections per server, uh, all you know, in, a, in a rack. It took them about 216 hours to bring a new rack online. This is used as part of an infrastructure outsourcing unit. Um, and the time to provision new resources was a critical part of their overall delivery model. With Seago, they were able to bring that time and complexity way down. So they brought it down to just two hours to provision new customer apps and just two cables per server by consolidating that environment, converging the environment, Ethernet and fiber channel on one wire and also by virtualizing. So now they can send out a standardized rack to wherever it needs to go. Uh, same exact physical configuration regardless of what the customer is doing. And then configure all the connections and software. So vastly simpler and vastly easier to manage. And obviously, as you can see on the right, uh, less cost. They brought down CapEx and also brought down operational expenses. Another great example is Blue Lock. Uh, a VMware vCloud service provider, uh, one of the leaders in this space, and they, they standardized on, on Seago as their backend infrastructure for exactly the same reason. Um, they wanted to be able to provide virtual machines to their customers uh, with the best possible service levels, with the highest possible performance, uh, and obviously at a cost which allowed them to make money. 
So what Tego let them do is run a lot more virtual machines per hardware device by giving them more bandwidth in each server and gave them a much simpler cabling environment and switch environment. So they reduced both the number of you know, cables going into a server, uh, reduced the number of switches by over 90%. So the bottom line for them was you know, a much more efficient environment and better service levels for their customers. So to summarize, you know, I think we've gone through you know, why you want a fabric. Uh, the fact that it gives you simplicity, the fact that it gives you agility, it gives you performance. You know, the fast, flexible, and fast that we identified as being the requirements here. That's exactly what Seago does. Um, simplicity comes from the convergence. The agility comes from providing that virtualized control of all the different connections, the software-defined connectivity from anything to anything else in your data center, and then the speed, the ability to get, get the single fat pipe going into all your servers and then dynamically allocate that bandwidth as you need it so you can optimize for whatever you're doing at that moment be it a vMotion, be it a, you know, a backup operation, or just be it you know, an ongoing operation uh, such as you know, a virtual machine or a virtual desktop, whatever it is, you can optimize your data flows to give you the best possible user experience in that environment. I think I could say uh, at the end here that when you reduce complexity, what you're doing is allowing people to refocus their attention onto higher value projects and higher value uh, activity with the, the business rather than spending a lot of time keeping the lights on. And the other thing I, I would say finally is, is there's been an awful lot of talk about cloud and a lot of that has been a lot of waffle and a lot of buzzwords. But what's uh, interesting is um, organizations like Seago are actually bringing about real technology that you can point to that's going to enable that process of, of getting into the cloud rather than it just being a, a lot of high polluting terms that don't really add up to much. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is not about delivering uh, architecture. This is about delivering real life solutions. Uh, so with that, um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and type them in. I'm not, I'm not seeing any come in at the moment, but if you have any questions, uh, please jot them in now. Or if you'd like to uh, just send them to me personally or to Mike, uh, you can send them over to me at my address, which is J-T-O-O-R, J as in John, T as in Thomas, O-O-R, at cgo.com, and we'd be happy to reply to you personally. So with that, Mike, I thank you very much for joining us and folks on the line here. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, um, hope you all have a great afternoon.